Hi, everyone. This is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest, but I've been following his work since 2007, 2008 when I was a stockbroker, and everything around me was starting to collapse, and I was looking for answers. And Eric Sprott was one of the first people I found who was uh, who had such the clarity, and he was calling things that were happening basically as a uh, pretty much before anyone else, or at least he was putting his thoughts out there in public. And then I went back and looked at his long-term track record, and it's, it was really excellent in terms of his other predictions. And I, I just really enjoy reading his work. I've been reading it since, basically, uh, every single time it comes out with the Sprouts Thoughts or Sprouts Markets at a glance. So thank you for joining us here on Wall Street for Main Street podcast today, Eric Sprout. Hey, Jason. Happy to be with you. Now, um. Eric, I, I want to talk more about your background first and your past predictions because, you know, in the short term, the, the commodities markets will, will do whatever whatever's going on. But, but before we talk about your views of the current economy and precious metals, you have one of the best long-term track records out there of any hedge fund manager since 1999. You wrote articles talking about the technology bubble collapsing, the banks, housing bubbles collapsing before they happen. How are you able to see these things play out with such clarity? Sure. Well – I guess it's based on having been around and be logical and uh, using lots of input from other people. Uh, so, for example, like you and your listeners, uh, we all look for thoughts from people uh, that are truly involved in industries that might point out that things aren't quite like what people are suggesting they are. And you just have to take those facts and, you know, push them forward, project them forward, and see, well, what's likely to happen here? And uh, so, for example, when I look back at the NASDAQ bubble, I mean, you can just see that it was totally ridiculous that things were trading at, you know, the number of eyeballs, and we used to get into multiples of sales and all sorts of ridiculous things. And probably the fact that then that there were so many IPOs, IPOs drain money out of the financial system, believe it or not, because in order to buy one stock, you have to sell another stock, and and it just got so crazy that you realize that this could not possibly last. So that that was sort of an easy call. Yeah, or or or, or Greenspan could have just printed up the money and given them to Wall Street to buy the IPOs. <laughs> exactly. And then the, the housing bubble wasn't too difficult because you you were certainly were aware of what type of loans were being given out, the liar loans. And there was much discussion on it. And, of course, these things just keep going on until finally you realize that people can't afford uh, – you, you brought the last sucker in to buy the home, and it's going to end. Same thing with the financial crisis. You re realize the leverage in the financial system and the volatility that was going on. And there's still huge leverage in the financial system. And the minute you get some volatility – when you're a leveraged institution like a bank that has five cents in the dollar protecting the dollar of assets, and five cents of capital, and then the dollar of assets falls by 5%, which is not a big amount, you're wiped out. And essentially, you know, most banks were wiped out in 08, but the governments came to the rescue. But it was quite predictable uh, what would happen here. Uh, same thing with Fannie and Freddie. I wrote an article in 07, I think it was called Dead Men Walking, and it said the following companies are broke. Fannie, Freddie, Citigroup, and General Motors. And it was more from a um, sort of an accounting analysis of what was going on that you could see that there's no way that they could survive in their current financial position. And sure enough, effectively, each one of them went broke. But and that, that was more of an accounting thing and, and the circumstances they all found themselves in. Yeah, I agree. I, I, you have an extensive accounting background, and I think the accounting skills are very important for an investor. It keeps you out of some of those really awful stocks like Enron, uh, you know, where Enron was saying how profitable it was, but yet it wasn't paying a dividend if they were so profitable. And you see that now. You just see really aggressive accounting now with so many publicly traded stocks where, you know, they're channel stuffing or doing all these other things now, and the average investor just sees the stock prices going up or that they've manufactured, financially engineered, higher earnings with stock buybacks or other types of accounting gimmickry and um, you know a more experienced accountant such as yourself can tell well maybe in the short term the stock's going to go a lot higher but this is not sustainable as a as an operating business this is not what I want to see out of a long-term investment and it's kind of like when you look at today and I think the s p put a study just the other day saying that 95 percent of all all earnings are going into buybacks 
Well, <laughs> you know that's not sustainable. And or, well, what if the earnings go down? Well, then you have less buybacks, right? And yep. uh, you just know that you know it's wrong. You know that zero interest rates are wrong or negative interest rates are really wrong. We all know that printing money is wrong. And it's only a question of when something breaks. When do we have that unintended consequence of these um fallacies in, in the, the financial arena, and they are all fallacies. And I think we all know they're fallacies, but in the meantime, the market goes up, we all think, well, it's okay. But it, it's not okay. It's just like housing stocks would continue to rally even though you realize, oh, my God, look at look at who they're selling homes to. Or the financial stocks in 08 would keep going up even though you realize financial Armageddon is on its way. Those, those are just things that tend to play out over time, and sooner or later, they meet their demise. And so far, I, of course, I've always believed that the economy is very, very punky. And uh, if it wasn't for government central planner involvement, I can go back to cash for bunkers, new home buyer tax credits, um, zero interest rates, TARP, TELF, uh, QE1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, LTROs. I mean, all these things are meant to keep the financial system together because it's in a very difficult leverage situation today and everything that all the planners have done is to keep the banking system going and of course as a result of it you see very little spill through to the real economy which of course is suffering and obviously you would be aware of this that you know 70 to 90 percent of the participants are are worse off today than they were 10 years ago so that ultimately will play out here economically yeah, I agree. The, I, I live right outside the D.C. metro area, Eric, which has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the whole country. And there's a lot of people in my age demographic right out of college who have enormous student loan debt who cannot find a full-time job. Or uh, I, I know engineers who have worked who are working at Starbucks, people who are – that's a humongous misallocation of capital. Or there's people who have two or three part-time jobs and can barely pay any of their bills, but yet you know they're counted in the statistics as fully employed. So it's, it's just really amazing that um, we've seen this. You know, obviously we have the, uh, the shale oil boom that's going on now. It's made the U.S.'s trade deficit come down. We've had uh, some techno technological innovation start lowering prices in certain industries, but I, I agree with your overall thesis of the, r the real economy. The majority of people on Main Street are not really seeing any benefits to the real economy for themselves. This economy is just so financialized to the point where you, know, you have the large corporations and the banks. Like the These things should have failed already, but they're so much larger that They've gotten so much larger after the crisis, right, than even 2008. These banks are even larger than they were prior to that. Yeah, and that's why it's important to keep a look at uh, the consumer confidence numbers, whether it's the Bloomberg survey and the other various surveys, and they're all uh, tending down here. And, you know, I happen to live in Canada, but I just think that this whole health care situation you have in the States, uh, we're going to see it play out here with all these higher deductibles and higher rates, and it's already a big part of everyone's expenses. and yeah, and then when I look at the rate increases expected in 2015, they're all double digits. And I think, well, the guy's already spending 20% of his income on health care. And then he gets a double digit increase. And that takes care of any wage increase that year right off the bat. That's before any other inflation happens to come along. So yep. it's not, uh, I'm not optimistic about the economy. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, I think best case scenario for the U.S. is worsening stagflation thanks to all these Keynesian programs and things like that. But the Obamacare you point, point that you brought up is, is a really accurate one. I, I talk with small business people. We have them listen to our podcast here in the United States. And from what they tell me, they, they don't want to hire full time. They're scared because of all the Obamacare rules, but they will hire part time so they can get around them. Sure. So that's 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 not the right incentives program that the uh, politicians and the bureaucrats and you know the progressives are putting into the economy. We're we're headed down the path. Unfortunately, you know we're we're not quite France where it's a seventy percent income tax or anything like that. And the private sector in France is in a lot of trouble. But we're also you know not to the point where it's the old United States where the taxes were low. Where where California used to be like the best state for low taxes, and it had so many different industries there. Like we're we're seeing we're seeing what's hap uh, what's going to happen in the United States play out in California as a preview. Yeah. I think. And you know, it's interesting. Whenever I look at the Bureau of Labor Statistic job report, I mean, you know, it could be ridiculously wrong because, as you point out, lots of first timers have to get two jobs now, but they're counted and they're counted as two jobs, but they're not making any more money. 
And uh, yeah. they're making I, way less. Yeah. <laughs> whether we're really creating any net new jobs, and you, you know, you see the last jobs report, and the participation rate was down, and the hourly earnings were down, and then well, that's just people getting part-time jobs that don't pay anything. And that's you can have a nice, fine, fine-looking jobs number, but if everyone's income is lower, you know what the result's going to be. Now, um, why do you think the Federal Reserve and so many other global central banks have been able to flood asset markets with so much liquidity, yet the real economy is not in hyperinflation? Well, they can do it because everybody is essentially bought in that it's okay. I mean, everybody believes it's okay, and they're all willing to pay the Fed, right? And, you know, if there was had been some negative reaction to uh, QE1 in the stock market, which there wasn't, uh, Maybe we wouldn't have had a QE2. Now, there was a negative reaction after they stopped it. Therefore, they're, okay, we better have QE2 to keep the market together. And, and so far, the influence of the central planners in the financial markets has had, a, obviously, a positive bias on asset valuation. But, of course, it requires ever-increasing amounts of money and a continual belief in the system. And, and one of the results of it, of course, you know, we got the interest rates so low that in a lot of European countries, we have negative interest rates now. So what happens when a guy has a lot of money in the bank and he's got to pay money to have it in the bank? I mean, what if they take the money out and then the bank's forced in turn to sell some assets? So you know, who knows what's going to evolve if you, we, if you start with the premise that zero interest rates are ridiculous, printing money is ridiculous, and then when it all reverses, of course, it'll be completely economically negative. Not that we have a strong economy, we don't. We have a weak economy in my mind. And I can point to Europe as being weak. I can point to Japan as being weak. I can point to China as being weak. I can point to the U.S. as kind of insane, not really growing, not really shrinking yet. But, you know, the world economy is, is not growing with all that's been done by the central planners. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, my, my view of the world economy, Eric, is very similar to yours. I, I, the way I would call it is I, I think every country is in one degree or another of worsening stagflation, whether that's the developing world or China or Japan or Europe or the United States. And it's all because of Keynesian economics and central planning. Like you said, they're just misallocating so much capital, whether it's be, you know, incentivizing students to take out degrees that they can't get a job on or the subprime auto bubble that you mentioned earlier. Or um, now you have, you know, foreigners who, are, who have gotten all this global QE, especially like here in the DC metro area where I live, there's a lot of uh, foreign Chinese who come in and buy properties all cash, and they really don't care, you know, if they're buying it too high or if they can rent it out uh, and make a nice uh, rental property income yield or things like that. So it, it just seems to me that it's fiat money is the problem, and that uh, the, the the way that the asset prices are measured is just going to keep going up, at least in nominal value. The, the name of the game is to just keep drastically devaluing the currency to move asset prices higher and devalue the debt and suppress interest rates and things like that. The solution is to keep financial asset values higher. That's the chosen route that they've made. Unfortunately, it leaves the economy a little bit, a lot in the lurch, and the results will ultimately play out where they can't hold it together. Okay, so let, let's transition now to the commodities market. Um, is it normal behavior for markets like the U.S. general stock market, the U.S. European, U.S. and European bond market, U.S. real estate, fine art, collect rare collectibles, antiques, and diamonds to all be going higher while gold and silver drop? No, there's no logic to it whatsoever. Um, I mean, I have this view of the market that the commercial interest in the market, and I guess I'm referring to commercial banks and, or other major financial institutions, can almost at will move any paper market in whichever direction they prefer to take it. And when I look at the precious metals market, I see um, lots of people buy uh, auctions on the, the various metals. And as you know, we have this thing called maximum pain where the guy, of course, the guy selling the auction is a commercial bank. And they always arrange for the price to be at the, at the lowest process possible price so they, the commercial banks can win the most. And the same thing has been going on in the precious metals in, in terms of COMEX position where the commercials are getting massively short of the metals. And it's so easy to engineer anything in the market today. I can give you an example. This is not a true example, but a theoretical example. I mean, if somebody put in a, I ordered myself 200 million of gold, 
on the COMEX and put it down the slowest pipe possible, every HFT out there would try to front run it, and you get this decline in prices. And believe me, not getting spent any money because everyone's front running it. Like most of the market's just front running today, so again, it's huge opportunity to increase prices because of the HFT is in the power in the market. And even in this recent decline, we see where the commercials, almost every week you've been able to reduce your shorts on a very large decline in the price of gold. And of course, the hedge funds have taken a big short position to not expect that now the hedge funds have a short position, the commercial interest will just run it the other way now and force them to cover their shorts. And it's just a game that's played all the time, moving this way, moving that way. And I think it has a lot to do with whichever is the position that the real money has taken, the commercial banks just force it the other way and, and make people take actions based on technical things that are going on in the market. So I personally think we're a position very nicely for them to sell off to reverse itself. They've got lots of uh, shorts out there by the hedge funds, and I, I suspect that it's just a game that is played where these money sources have huge amounts of money that they know they can move markets and they know what the charts say and they can make gold break down and everyone goes short. This is gold broke up in February, March. Well, it had a golden cross, but it never lasted. And of course, probably everyone went in and bought, bought gold and, and the company just turned it right around and had them where you wanted it. And I think a lot of that goes on in lots of markets, including the stock market. Yeah, I agree, and I think we're starting to see it even now in Bitcoin where the high-frequency trading algorithms have started creating drastic volatility in Bitcoin, and some of the uh, trading activity in Bitcoin, you know, it's coming in at illiquid hours of the trading, and it's big short volume, and it's just, it, it kind of reminded me since I've studied the precious metals market so much, it's starting to, it, maybe it's the same trading program, and they've just um, they've just tweaked it a little bit and moved it over to Bitcoin now too, but it's, it's just amazing that these guys are basically getting away with all this because I guess they bought off the regulators. I guess Bart Chilton now, he left the CFTC, and now he's overworking as a lobbyist for the high-frequency trading group. I guess he, he gave up that he couldn't convince more people at the CFTC that uh, that the precious metals markets are manipulated now that this investigation ended. Yeah, well, I think the best statement, the statement of all that was made quite a few years by a fellow named Chris Powell, who's with the data organizations, there are no markets anymore, just manipulation. And I think that probably summarizes where we are in markets today. Yeah, I would generally agree. I mean, obviously, there's a few exceptions here or there, but for the most part, I, I definitely agree with that uh, with with your uh, sentence there and with Chris Powell. Now, um, it, it seems like precious metal market manipulation has increased in 2011 going forward. Uh, do you agree with this assessment, and what will stop the manipulation from occurring even more so in the future? Sure. Well, I mean, I just find it so ironic that I can, you mentioned 2011, and I can tell you from 2011 to 2013. Uh, China came in and bought an extra 25% of the physical gold market, and the price went down. And I just can't imagine anybody buying 25% of anything extra and the price going down, but it did go down. And in the case of silver, in 2013, India came in and bought an extra 18% of the silver market, and the silver price went down, which means that the people who have the most money can expect to pay for price and can theoretically win that game. In order to end the game, you have to have a physical shortage. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, I was recently speaking with uh, uh, someone in the coin business who manufactured quite a few coins, and they basically said they're on allocation today, okay, because lots of buyers have come in to buy coins. And that's the sort of thing that we have to see. Now, I did ask that individual, I said, well, are you still able to sort the silver? <laughs> now that's, that's what I'd really like to find out. That, and he said, yes, I can, by the way. But the day that he can't sort the silver, in other words, because the demand's so large that he can't get enough silver, that's when the whole thing breaks out. And we see lots of evidence of, you know, declining inventories in, uh, in China. We saw even the Silver Institute say there was a supply deficit of 100 million ounces last year. And even when I look recently at the coin sales at the U.S. Mint, the first mint that has been announced, and it was very strong in September, it's been very strong so far in October, we could very readily get back into a situation where that physical shortage would manifest itself. 
We have a huge expiry coming up in the December silver option, where the outstanding contracts represent over 600 million ounces that will expire on a particular day. And, you know, we only produce 800 million ounces a year. God forbid that somebody resolutely stands in there because I'd like to take delivery because there's, there's, there's not nearly enough silver around to force delivery. But that would be the type of event that would put the cat amongst the pigeons. And we all know it's been basically a paper fraud and that when it comes to physical volumes, that they won't be available uh, relative to the promises that have been made by the guys making the naked shorts. Yeah, and there's position limits on the COMEX, so the COMEX has kind of anticipated that, that someone could come in like the Hunt Brothers or yourself and potentially blow up the market, but they put the rules in place where they could cash settle and other things, and the mainstream people on CNBC or Bloomberg would say, oh, it's just a temporary silver shortage, there's no reason to panic or anything like that, but obviously if it's going to take you uh, six months or a year, two years to get the silver that they claim is there, but it's not there, then I, I think that's a problem. It's a fraudulent market, the paper price shouldn't be where it's be then. The, it, everything that I've seen with the gold or silver market, or studying it based on your work and other experts, none of this, what appears to be going on now, based on reality, which is supply and demand fundamentals, none of this seems sustainable to me. Yeah, I mean, I totally concur in all the data. We had great data in for uh, gold demand in China. Uh, we got India coming back in here. I mean, I look at the whole 2013, and I think that that decline was a setup. To, I, I wrote an article in 2012 saying that the Western Central Bank gold had, having gold left, and I thought they, they're very likely to have very little gold left. So they orchestrate this sell-off. Uh, all the participants who, who are the major banks said, you got to sell your gold. Meanwhile, they bought the shares in the GLD and converted them to physical gold. And that caused an extra eight to 900 tons of gold to be available that year, which again is almost 25% uh, of annual supply. It came out of the ETF by scaring the hell out of people to sell their gold. And they, they took that physical gold and supplied some of the shortage. And even when I look at this year, let's say 14 versus 13, we already have about an 800 ton shortage uh, from ETFs this year versus last year because there's not nearly as much redemption. And 800 tons of the 4,000 ton market is 20% of the market. So other things being equal, how are we going to satisfy the shortage? Because it's not as though mine production is going up. And uh, we see pretty robust numbers uh, from lots of other countries who continue to buy gold. So. All these things uh, in the physical sense never seem to relate to the uh, the paper price, but they are all very, they're all very encouraging signs that the day of reckoning is coming in the physical market. Now, um, my, my next group of questions, Eric, is about the miners. Uh, you, you are on the board of directors for a number of gold and silver mining companies. Is there any more fat left to cut for these miners without them shutting down some of their mines or going bankrupt? Well, I'm, I'm not literally on the board of directors, but I, of course, I'm very involved in lots of mining companies because I'm a, myself, I'm a, my funds are uh, big time shareholders in these groups. And um, yes, I'm, and I've seen many examples where some companies do find ways of, of uh, decreasing their costs, but of course, most of it involves high grading. And when you high grade, of course, you end up leaving gold and or silver in the ground. You're bypassing it because you can't get back to it once you've mined through it. Um, and, and somehow they can uh, create some efficiency. Of course, in the long run, uh, it causes you to lose resources because the bypass gold is not, is not usable. You only got to take it out of your reserves. Um, but, and, and most of that's been done. Maybe there's even, you know, more push on with this and down at uh, twelve hundred dollars again, and there might be a little room, but there's certainly some mining companies where they don't have that ability. I think of the South African mining companies; they don't have the ability to hybrid. And the gold's in a seam that's way underneath the ground, and you got to keep mining. And they probably their costs are well above the price of gold today. So you're going to see some some uh, shutdowns uh, because of price here, and you're you, you also are going to see some shutdowns because of unfortunately because of the Ebola situation in Africa, which is decimating the three countries for sure. And it's not only a matter of time before it spreads to other countries there that are in the global producing area. So there's no way we're going to see an increase in production going forward here. 
Um, do, do, uh, you finance a lot of mining companies, or at least Sprott does, and Sprott Asset Man uh, Sprott Resource, your private equity. Um, is there a lot of debt and equity available for these miners, or it's at penalty rates, and these miners basically they're they're on their last legs. Either some of them are hoping for a buyout. The, I don't know if they even have the money to put some of their mines on cared maintenance at this point. Some of them are losing so much money producing an ounce of gold or an ounce of silver. Yeah. Well, we know that the the equity availability is de minimis here, particularly if a guy, you know, is, is just on his last few. Uh, we know that money is always available at very high charges. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a bit of a catch-22 when you enter into those types of transactions because you very well know that the interest rate might kill you if the price of gold and silver stay where they are here. Um, so, yes, we're going to see more and more companies uh, give up the ghost. Now, it may not be the producer. Maybe the producer can find some way, maybe by having less production at higher rates, that he can continue to produce and, and, and get through to see another day, or he's got a little bit of resource, or he maybe can sell off some asset and realize some cash. Um, but it's certainly an explorer or some guy trying to develop a mine today. I mean, it's just hopeless to think of trying to raise the money to, to bring on some mine that's going to start in 2016. I mean, I just I, I wouldn't even listen to the case myself today. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. It, it's really difficult to uh, t for the miners to raise any capital. I mean, I've just I've just uh, seen their balance sheets; they're in really bad shape. I mean, even the really quality, lowest cost producers in primary silver or primary gold are struggling at this moment. They have at least a couple unprofitable mines each, so they're starting to burn through cash. So it, it, none of this is sustainable, though, because like you said, you laid out the argument for, for the actual demand for the metal. The, there's obviously supply problems. There's no incentive for the miners to increase exploration budgets. Most of them have completely slashed them. So it, it, obviously I don't think this is sustainable, but if, this, if the, the prices last as low another 12 to 18 months, we're going to have potentially a, a lot of mine shutdowns or, or humongous production cutoffs or things like that, and then I, I think we're going to go back up. So we maybe have a spike low. And then finally, you know, we'll we'll have somewhat of a market again. I mean, you know, all prices are determined at the margin, and if you know you lose five to ten percent of your production, I mean, that'll have a dramatic impact. Other things being equal, supply stays the same. If investment demand stays the same for silver, for example, if solar stays the same, medical uses stay the same, then you will have a reversal of fortunes here. And there's no way that anyone could be predicting that. That uh, gold and silver supplies will increase in 2015. There's just no way I can assert that it's going to happen. And sooner or later, someone's going to come and say, "Well, it looks like silver production will be down five percent, maybe gold production will be down five percent." And if all the buyers maintain their rigor in buying, and a few souls figure out there's going to be a shortage, I mean, things can change very quickly. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the bottom is close. I mean, I can't tell you exactly when. I've tried to call the bottom. So, uh, I mean, I, I didn't even think gold would be able to go below 1500 because of how much it would destroy the, the miners and based on the physical market looking at Kuz Jansen's research. And I didn't think silver would go below 22. And now, you know, silver is e lower to the point where even the lowest primary cost producers on the planet for silver can't make, can't, uh, can't earn back their capital at this point. So it's, it's just been a really frustrating market. But I think we're near finally the bottom. Here, either that or, or the manipulation is going to intentionally bankrupt almost all the silver miners. Which I've heard that conspiracy theory out there that the plan is for China or Goldman Sachs to to bankrupt you know these these guys and then buy up the assets for pennies. But I I, I don't know if it's going to happen if they're going to go in and buy them uh, all all out of bankruptcy. Well, I mean, if you subscribe to the thesis that the the central planners and the commercial banks acting together have have money that can cause any market to do anything, uh, which I think is what we see transpiring here. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind exactly what's going on, that the commercial uh, increased their shorts when uh, the prices were breaking out, and then, of course, they orchestrate these declines, and they cover the shorts, and it's just a game that just keep moving the ball back and forth, and uh, they're in it to win. We've seen lots of examples of where people admit to to rigging markets, and we've had them in Forex now, we have them in LIBOR now. I mean, we've all already had a case where somebody um, uh, rigged, or somebody in Barclays rigged the gold price for a day so some client would lose money. I mean, it do it single-handedly. So imagine act, acting in concert how easy it is to do it.
Yeah, I, I completely agree. Like when people say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, that there's not market manipulation or gold or silver. Like there were some people that were at this broad event that I was at where I met you last week. Some people were very skeptical of what you and John Embry and others were saying. But I, I think the evidence is overwhelming that basically every market is manipulated. So uh, uh, obviously some are manipulated more to different degrees than others, like you know suppressing interest rates or making sure there's demand for government bonds or you know you can't short certain bank stocks now or keeping gold or silver capped or things like that. But we don't live in free markets anymore, Eric. There's no question we don't. I mean everything's manipulated. The interest rates manipulated by the Fed. They get arranged for you know by doing very derivative transactions with greater demand for treasury. And in fact, probably losing money in the process, but you're losing it to commercial bank. You're trying to bail out anyway. Um, you know, we've already seen instances of uh, conspiracy in many, many markets. The oil market. Uh, there's other commodity markets where fines have been paid for manipulation. I mean, it's just so it's so far flung that how anyone could, could not believe that there's reasons for manipulation. It almost seems odd to me, but. I look at it from my own perspective, and, and most people, a lot of people want to believe the system is clean, but most of us who, who have analyzed it realize the system isn't clean, and that the powers that be are using all the methods to hold things together at all times. Yeah, I agree. And the people that that believe the markets are clean, they're either ma they're either managing normally other people's money, so they're chasing you know the chart higher. They're high, they're either high frequency traders or trend traders, so they don't care if what the fundamentals of the market say. As long as the chart's going up or going down, they're trying to make money. So they they don't really care about the long term ramifications of of increased market interventions and central planning and things like this. And that's what I try to do with my podcast. I try to wake people up to what's really going on, and that's why I really enjoy your work so much is you know you have so much experience with markets and you've been telling people what's really going on in these markets for a very long time so I just want to thank you for for doing all the articles you write and I've really learned so much from reading them since I started you're like I said one of my role models in this industry and I hope to continue learning from you well thank you Jason I appreciate the opportunity of meeting with with you when you're up in Toronto and uh, I know that uh, you know podcasts like yours are very very valuable that we need alternative thinkers, if you will, because the conventional thinking, you know, is, is always typically wrong. And you have to look at the, the outcast, assess the argument, and see whether it makes sense and, and react accordingly. So thank you very much. Exactly, Eric. I completely agree. So thank, thank you again for your time, and uh, hopefully we can have you on again every couple months to uh, talk about uh, the economy and commodities and precious metals. I look forward to that. Thank you, Dave.